Joining me now from Barcelona is Carlos Silva. He's a senior member of the UPYD party, which opposes Catalan independence. Also in Barcelona is Elizabeth Castro, a political analyst and author who supports the region breaking away from Spain. And from Cardiff in the UK, Andrew Dowling is with us. He's a historian and author of The Rise of Catalan Independence, Spain's Territorial Crisis. Thank you to all three of you for joining us on the Newsmakers. Carlos, how important is this judgment from the German court going to be in terms of the current crisis? Uh, well, um, what the German has to decide now is to decide if there is a similar and equivalent uh, uh, punishable crime in, in the, in the, under the German law. And so I think that that's going to be um, a fast, a quick and, and easy thing to do because it, we're talking about um, European arrest warrant. So um, I think that despite the fact that there is no uh, crime of uh, rebellion in German law. There is a, a crime of high treason, um, which is um, for those who use um, who use force or the threat of force to undermine the constitutional order. So that's equivalent to uh, what Carlos Puigdemont has been accused of. So I think that in in a couple of months' time we'll have him back, sent back to Spain to be uh, to be judged. Liz, do you agree with that, that Carlos Puigdemont, when he was president of the Catalan parliament, threatened violence? Because that is something that Carlos is very correct about, the German court. If Carlos Puigdemont were to be found guilty of uh, the similar crime that he's accused of in Spain by the German court, that issue of the threat of the use of violence and use of violence would have to be proven. Well, and it would be very difficult to prove well, since um, no Catalan po politician or political leader has asked for any violence to be committed at all. In fact, Judge Yerena had said that in one of his decrees that uh, we know that the defendant hasn't uh, committed any violence. We know that they haven't asked anybody else to commit violence. But since they want independence and they know that the Spanish state will respond with violence, we're going to blame them for the Spanish state's violence. Um, that's not rebellion. It's not rebellion if the Spanish state uses violence against uh, a democratic people um, trying to be able to choose its political future by voting with ballot boxes. That's not violence. That's not rebellion. It's certainly not high treason in Germany. So, Carlos, if it's not rebellion, treason, what? sedition, uh, what about the misuse of public funds? There are some independent legal analysts who say that could be the one issue where the German court finds that there is a similarity between Germany and Spain. But is it your understanding, if Carlos Puigdemont were to be extradited on the charge of misuse of public funds, that would be the only charge that he could actually stand trial in Spain for? And if that's the case, would that be acceptable to the Madrid government? Because it's a much, much more minor charge than the others. Well, that is an important detail because I haven't mentioned violence in, in any moment. I'm talking about force or the threat of force, which is not exactly the same as, as violence. And that is what uh, German law says. And I think that it's evident that Carlos Puigdemont and all his government has to use force and the threat of force by undermining and uh, recurrently disobedience, uh, their recurrent disobedience of law in Spain in trying to undermine the constitutional order and, and that using the power um, in the charges, right, they belong to the charges to, to, um, to force um, Spain's, Spain's um, constitutional frame. Um, so um, I think that's an important detail. Also that we're not talking about an, an extradition request, but um, an arrest warrant, which is a, also a guarantee that, that things are going to happen um, in an easy and quick way. I think that the um, German courts uh, won't have any doubt about it. And I think that uh, the judge, after all the, he's done, all the government, government um, the, the members of the um, Catalan government have done uh, during all this process to judge them by the misuse of public funds will be really unacceptable for the Spanish government. Andrew, you've written that the detention of Puigdemont, Jordi, Turul and other secessionist leaders, and then here's the quote, brings the extraordinary and tumultuous events of Spain and Catalonia since September 2017 closer to an end point. How exactly closer to an end point? Because it just seems to be another marker in a long struggle.
Yeah, well, I, when, I, when I say that, what I mean is it, it brings to an end point the, uh, the nature of the conflict as it's, as it's happened, really, between 2012 and 2017, which is a very optimistic, very positive and very peaceful, actually, independence movement that was also incredibly naive. It, it believed that it would have international support. It had zero international support. It completely underestimated the strength the capacity of the Spanish state to respond. So what we're seeing, we're, the end, we're seeing the end of a cycle of Catalan independence and the start of a new cycle of Catalan independence, which is starting now. It's a much more, um, you know, it's a movement that's split internally between, if you want, uh, radicals and pragmatists, between those who think we now have to build a greater social majority. And when I talk about a greater social majority, we should note that the Electoral support for Catalan independence in any election since 2012 has never gone above 48%. So it was incredibly naive of the independence forces, in my view, to try to break with Spain when they never even had plus 50% of the vote. And again, that was confirmed in December 2017 in the most recent election. So the only way... Catalan independence is absolutely not an end. The, the, the reasons that have produced the turn to independence, the legitimate grievances and perhaps illegitimate grievances are still there. They haven't been addressed. So the movement will continue. But if you want the, the incredibly naive movement that existed between 2012 and 2017 has gone. Liz, that's not a bad point, is it? Because there hasn't been any international support for Catalan independence and the secessionist parties are split amongst themselves. That's weakened the whole... Puigdemont-inspired movement, hasn't it? It's not a Puigdemont-inspired movement. It's a movement that's inspired by the people. And you can call them naive or you can call them Democrats. They believed that mobilizing, educating themselves, electing a majority in the Catalan parliament, insisting on a referendum to peacefully, as Andrew said, peacefully de determine uh, their own future, um, and that their voice would be heard. Is that naive or is that democracy? Do we really believe that the only way to change things, uh, to change political borders is through war and through force? I don't believe so. If that makes me my naive, then, then you know, I, I accept that assessment. Um, the fact is, and then the question about whether or not we're divided, we're actually quite diverse. That's a strength, that's not a weakness. Uh, the Catalan independence movement draws strength from the right to the left. Um, with lots of different parties, yes, sometimes they disagree, but they all uh, agree that Catalans deserve the right to choose their own future by voting, that there has been no force used or threatened, no force, no violence, uh, Mr. Carlos, um, and that this is what needs to be taken into account. Have we had international support? Well, in fact, uh, Puigdemont has traveled to Finland. Uh, he's traveled to Denmark. He's traveled to uh, a number of other countries before uh, being forced into exile. Um, and it would, you know, once we declare independence, that is when uh, we will have or not have international support. Right now, yes, He declared now, independence. Yes, he, declared after... independence. <clears throat> he did it in October, Liz. Well, Sorry, Andrew, come, well, come, come that... in on that. Go on, well, Andrew, and then well, Carlos after Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, the first. official Catalan Republic was... Yeah, the Republic was proclaimed on the 27th of October 2017. Um, five months later, not one country in the world has recognised the Catalan Republic. There are only two places in the world that have never had any recognition on that scale. One of them is South Ossetia, which attempted to secede from Russia in the 1990s. The second one is Catalonia. It's unprecedented to have zero international recognition. It doesn't matter if you get a parliamentarian in Scotland, a parliamentarian in the European Parliament, or a member of the Green Party. What defines whether you're recognised internationally is international recognition. And it has been an absolute failure of the, of the Catalan independence movement to achieve any independent recognition. They have zero. They have none. OK, so, Carlos. But the new Catalan movement that has to be well, built the, from now on has to, has to find that, a new uh, approach. One of the reasons that didn't have any recognition so, is because it decided so not hear. to press against the uh, Spanish government. It, uh, the idea was to invite negotiation, to invite dialogue and not to create a violent conflict. That was Catalonia's decision to back off of the Declaration of Independence to um, avoid the violence that Spain was threatening and that it had shown on October 1st by beating you know, innocent voters, peaceful voters. So um, you know, that's a question that's going to have to be taken into account. And, and, and this is where the, the whole world doesn't understand why Spain refuses 
to listen to any of Catalonia's grievances, even though such a sizable proportion of the, the population is saying, we are not satisfied with the current situation. You need to talk to us. And Spain keeps saying, no, no, no. And in fact, we're going to jail all of your political leaders in jail in unheated Madrid prison cells. It's ridiculous. That's okay. not a 21st century democracy. Liz, you say the whole world well, doesn't understand the approach that uh, the Madrid government is taking. The EU is 100% behind Mariano Rajoy's handling of this situation. There are various reasons for that. The but presidents this is... of the EU, perhaps, but the people not so much. But yes, OK, that's a different matter. It's a, it's Carlos a, it's Silva? a club of member states. OK, Carlos, you've wanted to come in for a few minutes. Well, it's just clear. It... Yes, oh, OK, well, it's clear that they haven't achieved any, any international support. The bid for independence has, has clearly failed. So now they must go through um, a, a painful process of acknowledging this. They must come to terms um, with reality, especially a, a whole society who, which has been intoxicated by this um, um, nationalist propaganda for decades. So uh, now they're trying to, to say that it's, it's all about democracy and the fight for democracy, but it's not true. It's not true. Um, democracy cannot be uh, the imposing uh, or the imposition of, of the will of less than half of the population to the other half, despite what they think. It's not a, it's something that it's um, over, an overwhelming support of, of Catalan citizens to that, to that option. So in any case, uh, there's been a, a recent statement of the deputy president of the European Commission who said that you can be against the law, you can discuss the law, you can modify the law, but you can't break the law. So we're talking about the rule of law, the rule of law which is one, which is the pillar, uh, the foundation of all democracies. So democracy is that. Democracy is not fighting for fighting for privilege. It's not fighting for immunity. Um, one is always um, um, liable of, of being held responsible for the facts, and that's what's going to happen to Puigdemont and all the people that have taken part in this plot, this rebellion against the institutional order in Spain. Carlos, when you're talking about being be ruled lovely. by a minority of the population, Spain was Liz, the rule sorry, of law, please, Liz, 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 I'll give you a chance sorry, in a second. Sorry, sorry. I can't Carlos, hear when you're talking okay. about being ruled by a minority, are you talking about the number of people that voted in the referendum in Catalonia in October? Now I'm talking about the, the last legal, the latest legal elections in, in Catalonia, where the pro-independence parties um, got less than half of a vote. Yeah, they may have votes, done, but right? they've got, they've got sorry, the they've got 70 out of 135 seats. So if those secessionist parties can work together and go for the one thing that they all agree upon, and they can agree upon independence, then that's the majority. 70 out of 135 seats in the Catalan Parliament is a majority. It's a, it's a, very, it's, it's a very slim majority. Yeah, OK, fine. But you look at Brexit, you OK? Can, that, that deal's go been going on the in the legal UK frame as well. And break... Listen, come on. 70 out of 135, oh, we can was both do very simple maths. Okay. Carlos, where's the compromise that, going to come that from? That was a referendum. That was a referendum. We, we're talking about the support of the voters in a real election. Right. We're not talking about a fake referendum where only the pro-independence people uh, voted. So we're talking about a real In fact, it was a referendum that was called uh, by voting. a majority of the Catalan parliament, not a fake referendum, an actual referendum called by a majority no, of no, the no, Catalan no, no, parliament. No, 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 no. The referendum, no, no, that's not true. That's not, it's absolutely false. History. The referendum was, no, no the, the, the referendum truth. was called, was called Spain by Spain has refused uh, to allow Catalonia to have a referendum like the UK allowed rejected Scotland. They the were able to solve okay. it in a democratic the, way as opposed <laughs> to this autocratic way. If you're way both going to talk at the same time, no one's going to hear all anything. The was absolutely unlawful. OK, Andrew, no, two people talking over each other. That yes, doesn't work in terms of cognition of the argument. Um, Sorry, I didn't catch that with Liz yeah. speaking. OK. <laughs> As an, Wait, outsider, again? No, as an outsider, Andrew, where would you see yes. a potential compromise? I can completely understand, and I'm sure everybody can, that the passions that have been inflamed within Spain might make compromise difficult. If you were to come to the country as an outsider yeah. and as an advisor, what could you possibly say to the two parties that would be some sort of compromise? Because at the moment, there's none.
No, there's no compromise, and actually part of, or a strong part of the reason there's no compromise is actually the position of the Madrid government. And I think Liz is absolutely right that no concessions of any kind have been offered to the Catalans the past five years. The leaders of independence have never been able to go back to their people and say, look, Madrid is offering us, it's not, it's not independence, but at least it's a start, or we can build on this, or we can, you know, go in a certain direction. Unfortunately, the policy of the Madrid government, which is, you know, still being practiced today, is, is to the use of legal mechanisms to solve a political problem. Now, the Catalan question is a political problem, and you need to, even if I say 48% is not enough to break with Spain, you do have to recognize the grievances of many Catalans. And the Catalans want to have um, the protection of their language, culture, and identity. They want to have greater say over how their taxes are collected. They want greater uh, infrastructure spending on their economy. They've got a whole range of, if you want, political, economic, and cultural grievances that can actually be, you know, very resol easily resolved if there's the will. You know, this isn't the Middle East, it isn't a, t a situation of terrible violence, but it requires the willingness of, of parties in Madrid and in Barcelona to sit down at a negotiating table and hash out these issues. Unfortunately, that still hasn't happened. Uh, Liz, would Catalan secessionists be prepared for some sort of compromise, shall we say, rather than full independence immediately, some uh, sort of deal like the Basque region has with more physical autonomy and other sort of compromises granted by the central government? Would that be OK, or is it independence or bust? No, that's a, that's a really interesting well, question. Greece, no, and if no. that question had been asked 10 or 15 years ago, then, then it might have been able to be solved in the way that Andrew... Um, says what's really remarkable about this situation is um, exactly the fact that Spain has made no effort whatsoever to even listen to any of those grievances. It has no idea what is going on in Catalonia. And so it's lost a huge amount of credibility. In fact, there was um, a fair bit of negotiations over a new statute of autonomy between 2000 and 2006 um, that tried to address some of those issues. Unfortunately, the current president, Mariano Rajoy, brought that uh, statute of autonomy to the Constitutional Court and had it stripped of many of the important things that Catalans had been able to negotiate, which weren't even very, uh, they weren't very important differences in uh, what, what they had, the, the relationship that they had before. Um, so, so if you can um, forge this new agreement, but then the Partido Popular is going to take it to the court and take out all of the bits that you, you know, were able to negotiate, you lose all your credibility. The other problem is that even if Rajoy should suddenly tomorrow um, you know, have a revelation and say, wow, maybe we should really listen to the Catalans and see what's going on with them, his party would burn him alive. There is okay. no way that he can go back and say, oh, actually, we were wrong well, about taking like 16 billion euros off the top of Catalonia's finances, because um, where's that money going to come from? They've gotten used to uh, using Catalonia's resources um, in, uh, you know, in the way that it does, and it's an incredibly corrupt party. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of people under investigation. Okay, that, 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 that's a separate Bora. issue. So, separate issue. You know, there's please. not a way of getting we'll out about of that. Corruption. that. Okay, no, 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 let's not talk Catalonia, about corruption. Right? If you want let's to talk, talk about, about corruption, Catalonia. we can talk Ca about corruption in Catalonia. Carlos, let's not talk right. about that, okay? I you asked Liz not so, to. So, Carlos, uh, the last well, word like, to you, please. Is there going to be a compromise? Yes. Is there anywhere that the Partido Popular, Mariano Rajoy's party, leading a minority government mind and having to deal with the Basque party as well, PVN, whose support he needs, What's he going to do about the Catalan issue? Well, I would like to remind the, the, the audience that uh, the Catalonian government has, one, was, has the highest self-government in, in all Europe, together with the Basque, with, with the Basque country. So uh, the possibility of a compromise um, to uh, give more uh, competencies to the regional government is almost impossible, but, but because that would mean uh, the, the resignment of, of the national government because um, there is no other regional government in, in all Europe that has his, its culture, its language recognized as much as the Catalan uh, has. That is a, is a fake debate. So there is a very slim, um, speed, slim range for, for, a, for an agreement because it's not a, a political issue. Right? So it's, it's something that's been built up uh, during decades just to create this this uh, false narrative, and so that what I think that it's now a legal issue, and uh, the um, pro-independence parties must accept that they lost, they've lost the game. We have run out of time. Really appreciate your presence on the newsmakers. Thank you.